Well, I'm glad you have decided to come uh, to this lecture today. The downside of being on faculty here is you don't have anyone introduce you, so if no one knows who you are, then they're stuck not knowing who you are. And uh, I don't know, maybe that's a good thing. Uh, lower expectations, as I was just telling someone, is always better. Uh, you're far less likely to be disappointed if your expectations are low. So, um, I don't know. That's just life, I guess. Well, if you were here for Dr. Hamilton's lecture uh, earlier today, you will know that uh, I did everything that I possibly could to work this into the book of Esther somehow, and I was just completely unable to do so. Um, and so I, I got stuck with Rachel and Leah instead. Uh, no, actually, I, I was planning on doing that anyway. This is a topic I've been meaning to do in one of these lectures for some time, and this was the first time it really seemed to fit well with the, the overall theme of the lectureship and, and marriage and family kinds of things, because you get a really good glimpse of uh, these women and their character and the nature of the marriage that they had, and uh, we're going to try to explore some of that. The downside, is, as someone said to me several months back when they asked what I was going to talk about, and I said I was going to talk about this topic, they said, is that the same thing that you do in your book on, on Genesis about Rachel and Lee? And I said, well, yeah, it, it is. He said, well, everyone who's read it is going to know that already. And so I said, well, I'll, I'll dismiss everyone to whom that applies. <clears throat> and then I realized my mom's not even here this year. <clears throat> and so here we are with everyone remaining, I suppose. Yeah, there's a big difference uh, between writing a book and having people actually buy the book. And there's still another big difference between people buying it and people reading it. And I'll tell you, that book on Genesis, it is a fantastic doorstop if you need one of those at some point uh, along the way. Well, everyone knows the story of, of Jacob and Rachel and Leah, at least to some degree. And it is just a fantastic love story, isn't it? I mean, it's the kind of thing that, that Hollywood romance movies are made of. Love at first sight. I mean, just, it, it's overwhelming how much he loves her immediately. And the obstacles that he faces to get her seem insurmountable. Fourteen years of labor to secure this woman. But he loves her so deeply, those years just fly by. And... All because she's just such a wonderful, wonderful, you know, apple of his eye kind of, of woman. Well, as you might expect, Hollywood love stories typically aren't the sort of thing that Christian love stories should be made of. And I'll suggest to you even here at the outset that we're going to find that to be the case in the love story of Jacob and Rachel and how Leah plays a role into this as well. Again, you know the basic story, right? Jacob sees Rachel. He immediately is overwhelmed and loves her deeply. And Laban, however, is concerned with a different kind of thing. Laban, the father of Rachel, and he, he deceives Jacob into marrying Leah and it's going to require an extra seven years of work. He agreed, I'll work seven years for your daughter's hand in marriage. And uh, that, that deception happens. He actually allows, her to, allows uh, Rachel to marry Jacob just a week after the first wedding. I don't know if everyone's caught that little detail before or not. He doesn't have to wait a full 14 years before he marries her. He marries her the next week and then has to work the additional seven years after that. But Jacob loves Rachel more than he loves Leah. But God blesses Leah with children far before he blesses Rachel with children. And this is where we're going to begin our investigation because you know that part of the story. And some of these other details are really easy to read past without stopping and thinking about in a little bit closer of a kind of way. And so we're going to begin, if you want to follow along in your Bibles, in Genesis chapter 29, the end of that chapter. Because the first thing I want to show you, if you've never considered this before, is that we can get some insight into the character of these women just from the stories of them giving birth to their children and what they name their children and what they say as they are naming their children. You get little glimpses into the kind of person they are. And so the first thing we're going to do today is try to get some insight into their character from the naming of their children. We'll move from there to looking at other aspects of their character that we can find before we try to come to some kind of conclusion about what these women were really all about and what the Bible's uh, teaching on these women really uh, is at the end. So Genesis chapter 29, beginning in verse 32. I'll start in verse 31 for the full paragraph there. When the Lord saw that Leah was hated, he opened her womb, but Rachel was barren. And Leah conceived and bore a son, and she called his name Reuben, 
For she said, Because the Lord has looked upon my affliction, for now my husband will love me. She conceived again and bore a son, and said, Because the Lord has heard that I am hated, he has given me this son also. <coughs> Excuse me. <clears throat> and she called his name Simeon. And she conceived and bore a son, and said, uh, now this time my husband will be attached to me because I have borne him three sons. Therefore she called his name Levi. And she conceived again and bore a son and said, This time I will praise the Lord. Therefore she called his name Judah. Then she ceased bearing. And so uh, immediately as the story progresses, you find the, the births of these first four sons of Leah. And we won't stop and, and examine what every name means specifically. Know that what the name means is closely related to what they say about the name. You can probably find that in marginal notes. If not, you can find it in commentaries if you care that much. Um, but she names them something and says something about them as they are born. With Reuben, she says, the Lord, and notice here, Lord is in all caps. This is the name of God as it is changed to Lord in most translations. Because Yahweh has looked upon my affliction, for now my husband will love me. Simeon, because Yahweh has heard that I am hated, he has given me the son also. Uh, Levi, now this time my husband will be attached to me because I've borne him three sons. Judah, this time I will praise Yahweh. And so in all of these names of these children, you see two basic things happening, one or the other or sometimes both. First of all, you find what you might call a generally optimistic look at life. Here is a woman who is essentially hated by her husband, and she is, as we will see, most certainly hated by her sister. And her perspective as each child is born is things are looking up. Things are going to get better. I'm, I'm giving these children to my husband, and this is what a husband wants a wife to do in the ancient world, of course, is to continue the family line. And I am giving these children to my husband. Now he's going to think better of me. And of course, by the last one, that's kind of dropped off a little bit. And, and maybe that's uh, something that we're seeing in her in particular as she's focusing less on that and more on God. But that's the second thing you notice here is her focus is not only on a generally optimistic outlook on life, but it's a focus on God and not God in some general sense that I believe in some kind of uh, creator being of some sort who must be out there somewhere because, you know, the cosmological argument or something. Instead, she understands Yahweh, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the covenant God who has established a personal relationship with this family. Over in Haran, she has come to know this God. And there may be even implications that she is a praying person when she says Yahweh has heard that this is the case. And so you see two things in the naming of Leah's first four children. First general optimism in spite of her circumstances of course a longing to be loved by her husband and what woman wouldn't want that right and then also this focus on god this apparently personal relationship with god well rachel is unable to have children and she envies her sister we're told in verse one and we'll come back and talk about uh those first few verses in a little while but what she does down in verse four of chapter 30 is she gives him her servant bilhah as a wife and jacob went into her and, and bilhah conceived and bore jacob a son then rachel said god has judged me and has heard my voice and has given me a son therefore she called his name dan Rachel's servant Bilhah conceived again and bore Jacob a second son. And then Rachel said, With mighty wrestlings I have wrestled with my sister and have prevailed. So she called his name Naphtali. Now if you've stopped and carefully considered already what Leah said and, and Leah's perspective as she named her children, you're already catching a little bit of something different in what Rachel is saying here. Now, a little bit of background, of course, in the ancient world, again, the, the, the mother, the wife's primary job is to produce progeny for the family, to produ produce the next generation, to continue the family line. And when the, the wife was unable to for some reason, they would typically, culturally, by their laws, give a handmaid to the husband to carry on the family line. Those children would be counted as the children of the wife who was unable to bear. So what she's doing here, for better or for worse, however you want to reconcile this with the rest of the biblical teaching on marriage, different discussion for a different day. But whatever you think about that, she's doing what was culturally acceptable, at least, as part of their cultural situation. 
And that's why she is the one who names these children, because they are to be counted as her children. The first one, she says, God has judged me. To which you say, wait a second, God has judged you how? Uh, I'm not quite sure what's going on. That's a bit ambiguous. But I think that is informed by the naming of the second child. With mighty wrestlings, I have wrestled with my sister and have prevailed. She sees herself in a sibling rivalry, a battle with Leah for some kind of preeminence, and she sees with the birth of her handmaid second son evidence that she has come out on top of this battle. She has prevailed. And I would suggest that that's probably the context of the first child as well. That what she's saying when she says God has judged me is that God has judged in my favor in this regard. And by giving me this child, I see that God has judged in my favor. Notice it's God has judged in my favor, not Yahweh has judged in my favor. That might be significant. Again, it, it, it's uh, probably a bit too precise to say it must be significant. But it very well might be when God shows up, uh, rather than the name of God, sometimes it, it implies a more distant kind of relationship. Uh, God as a creator God, God as, as all-powerful, not necessarily God as being in a personal relationship. And so maybe that's significant, maybe it's not. But again, notice the difference between Leah saying, I have a relationship with Yahweh. I care deeply about him. I'm praising him. He has heard me. And things are looking up for me in my relationship with, I'm beating my sister. I'm coming out on top of this thing. I mean, just that by itself already gives you something of a hint of these women, doesn't it? Well, Leah, as we'll talk about later, is not above sibling rivalry. Whereas Rachel could at least say, it is the custom that I must do this in order to, to continue on my family line. Leah doesn't have that argument. When she gives her handmaid to Jacob, it seems that what she is doing is simply participating in sibling rivalry and envy. And so I would at least, as far as my reading of the text, say that she is not doing the right thing here. My, my goal today is not to exonerate Leah to the point of sainthood or anything like that. She has her flaws, as does everybody. But what she does is she sees that she has ceased bearing children. So she took her servant Zilpah and gave her to Jacob as a wife. Then Leah's servant Zilpah bore Jacob a son. And Leah said, good fortune has come. So she called his name Gad. Leah's servant Zilpah bore Jacob a second son. And Leah said, happy am I, for women have called me happy. And so she called his name Asher. Notice that God's name is dropped out of this entirely. And again, I think that might be appropriate if she is participating in something just out of envy and sibling rivalry rather than something she needs to be doing in the first place. But even so, notice the optimistic perspective still. The, the names of these children are good fortune has come and I am happy because everyone can see that I am happy. And again, it's a very different perspective to look at that than to look at, say, uh, look at Rachel who says, you know, I'm beating my sister. I, I, I'm winning here in this battle. Well, continuing on then, Leah has more children next down <coughs> Excuse me. In verse 18, Leah conceived again. Um, and she says, God has given me my wages because I gave my servant to my husband. So I called his name Issachar. So she called his name Issachar. Verse 19, Leah conceived again and bore Jacob a sixth son. And Leah said, God has endowed me with a good endowment. Now my husband will honor me because I've borne him six sons. So she called his name Zebulun. And so the last two of Leah's children are born. And again, I think if, if you take the perspective that Leah is doing something wrong in giving her handmaid to Jacob to continue the sibling rivalry, then you also probably have to conclude that her reasoning is wrong when she says, God is rewarding me for giving my handmaid uh, to, to, to my husband for, for more children. And you can reason that a different way if you like. But again, I would argue that Leah's reasoning here is probably not the best in thinking that she was doing the right thing in giving her handmaid to her husband. Uh, but again, you don't have to presume that all of the Bible characters are perfectly flawless and state truth all the time. They, they can be wrong. In fact, we know very often they are wrong, and so this may simply be a case of that. But again, notice just in general, you still have this very optimistic kind of perspective in how they look at things. 
But then notice also, if you take a step back to verse 17, is that even if it may be wrong-headed in terms of her interpretation of what's going on, why is it happening? Verse 17, God listened to Leah. And so if the implication of prayer earlier was too subtle, here you have very clearly the fact that she is calling out to God and has this kind of personal relationship with God that is illustrated, if nothing else, by the fact that she knows his name and prays to him. And then Rachel finally has her own children. Verse 22, God remembered Rachel and God listened to her and opened her womb. She conceived and bore a son and said, God has taken away my reproach. And she called his name Joseph, saying, May the Lord add to me another son. And that's one of those statements I'm not quite sure what to do with sometimes. May the Lord add to me another son. Notice she uses God's name. So there is at least some understanding of the identity of this God that she hasn't said much about otherwise. Notice that God listens to her, so apparently she is at least on some level calling out to God and appealing to God, praying to God about this matter. We'll talk about that a little bit more in just a moment. But then there is this statement, may the Lord add to me another. And how do you read that kind of statement? Now, I, I think there's very much a way in which you can say what's going on here is excitement and desire for more children. And that is obviously a very understandable thing. I mean, to, to, for a, a mother to desire more children, especially in this ancient context, would be a very natural thing. But through this entire process, she has been desperately pining to have her own child, and finally she does. And there seems to be a lack of gratitude in what she says. I mean, how would you feel if your child had been seeking some toy? Whatever it was, they've let you hear about how much they want this toy for the last five years. And finally, you say, you know what? I'm going to have compassion. I'm going to get my child this toy that he's wanted so badly. And you give it to him and he says, this is great. Now I want another one. <laughs> Wouldn't you be tempted to just take it back? Really? That, that's the gratitude I get out of this? Something you've desperately longed for, I finally give it to you, and your response is, may he add another one to me. And so you can understand the excitement, you can understand the desire, but the question I ask here is, where is the gratitude in her responses? Especially compared to what Leah says over and over and over, that God is behind all of this. Her reference to God is simply, may God give me another one which is a very different sounding kind of thing. And even if you read that in the best possible light, it gets very difficult to read Rachel's naming of children in a positive light when you get to the last son, who was not named Benjamin. Not yet, at least. Over in chapter 35, much later on, in verse 16, then they journeyed from Bethel. When they were still some distance from Ephrath, Rachel went into labor, and she had hard labor. And when her labor was at its hardest, the midwife said to her, Do not fear, for you shall have another son. And as her soul was departing, for she was dying, she called his name Benoni, which means son of my sorrow. These are Rachel's dying words to name this last son. And she names this last son, son of my sorrow. Notice the uh, first person focus there, who she's concerned with, is her. And what is her sorrow in this case but the fact that she is dying? If I may paraphrase, Rachel named her final son, I killed mom. That's what he is given for the rest of his life. Except for the fact that her, his father called him Benjamin, son of my right hand. 
Now, there are two things that are very important in this ancient culture, one of which continues all the way until now. The first is a name. Names were far, far more important then than they are now. These days, a name is basically what you just happen to be called. Unless it's a family name that's been passed down for generations and generations, it's just some conglomeration of uh, syllables that your parents stuck you with, and that's what you're called for the rest of your life. You probably don't even think that much about it. Back then, names were significant. Names dealt with character. Names were an identity of who you were, and your name had a deep meaning that was related to your character and to your identity. And names were not changed haphazardly in the ancient world the way they sometimes are now. So to change a name was a significant thing to do. When a mother who is naming the child says, this is what his name is going to be, and the father says, no, this is what his name is going to be, don't overlook that fact. That is a significant thing for him to do. Add to that the fact that these are her dying words. And even today, a deathbed request carries more weight than any other request, doesn't it? If you are standing at the bed of your father or mother or spouse or sibling or whoever it may be, and they say, do this one last thing for me, don't you go above and beyond to make sure that gets done because that's their final request. And so here in the naming of Benjamin, you have a name which is significant and not easily changed, or Benoni, I should say. And then on top of that, the deathbed request of Rachel. And both of those things, Jacob says, no, that is not going to be the case. That is not going to be the name of my last son. I am changing his name to something else. And you wonder what's going through his mind at this moment. And I think we can get a glimpse of it as we continue on. But just, again, just in the naming of the children here, as you read through this portion of the story and you stop and you think about what they're naming them, what they're saying as they name them, you're getting little hints at their character. And overall, this is what I would say about these two women just from the hints that we've seen already. First of all, Leah is someone who is, generally speaking, grateful, happy, optimistic, and has a relationship with Yahweh God, the God of Abraham, Isaac. Isaac and Jacob, and she knows about this God and cares about this God and worships this God. Rachel, if I may be perhaps a little bit uh, overstepping what we've said so far, but I think it will show as we continue, is a bit self serving and immature. At the very least, she seems ungrateful in her naming of Joseph and very much bitter in her naming of Benoni and bitter in the naming of her handmaid's children as well as she is focused solely, again, on herself. I want another child, son of my sorrow. God has judged in my favor, and I'm winning my fight with my sister. Me, 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 all four of them, all the way down. That's Rachel's focus through all of this. Crickets are chirping. <laughs> I thought I'd lost some of you. I didn't realize it was that bad at this point. <laughs> All right. I know names are tough. We'll move on. Um, a, a second thing to consider as, as we look at the, at the character of these women are just some of the, the processes that they go through uh, in, in their lives. Uh, Genesis chapter 30, again, we get the story of... Uh, the, the naming of the children, but behind that is the story of how Rachel tries to have children. All of the things that she goes through. And it's striking to kind of look at them in order in terms of what she seems to be doing to have children. First of all, in verse 1, she tries the old method of demanding children from her husband. When Rachel saw that she bore Jacob no children, she envied her sister. She said to Jacob, Give me children or I shall die. Again, you can understand her being distraught over her lot in life. Uh, this is, again, a significant thing in the ancient culture for women to have children. You can, you can get all of that. But the way she says this, it's almost as if she thinks it's his fault that she can't have children. And clearly it's not his fault. I mean, wherever you want to put the blame, Lee is doing just fine. It's not his fault that she can't have children. But to go to him in this kind of emotional uh, turmoil and just demand, to, this is her first step that we see. The first thing she does to try to have children is to demand them of her husband. After that, then she turns to her handmaid, and we talked about that already. 
ready? And so again, this is typical cultural sort of thing. No surprise, she gives her handmaid to Jacob to, have, to secure descendants through her handmaid. But then as the story continues on, when you get down, uh, <coughs> I'm sorry, uh, in verse 14, in the days of the wheat harvest, Reuben went and found mandrakes in the field and brought them to his mother Leah. Then Rachel said to Leah, please give me some of your son's mandrakes. But she said to her, is it a small matter that you've taken away my husband? Would you also take away my, my son's mandrakes as well? Rachel said, then uh, he may lie with you tonight in, in exchange for your son's mandrakes. And so they do this husband trade thing and she gets the mandrakes and then she has her night with Jacob as well. Well, what's the significance of that? Well, these mandrakes were fruit that were thought to be an aphrodisiac and to increase fertility. Basically what she's doing is kind of a modern, uh, not modern, but in, in that cultural situation, uh, current in their day, uh, organic method of fertility treatment is what she's doing. She's taking matters into her own hands in order to secure children. I, I'm using the best medicine I've got at my availability, and that's what I'm going to do to have these children. And then when you get down to verse 22, you find that she's done something else, finally. Then God remembered Rachel, and God listened to her. Oh, huh. She prayed. Maybe that should have been somewhere before demanding them of Jacob. And we don't know, again, how thoroughly and continually she's been praying. You've got to be careful not to make an argument from silence in this case. But it is striking as you read the story. One demand, two handmade, three mandrakes, four pray. That's how it reads in the context of the narrative. That this is the last thing that she does in contrast to Leah, who at the very outset, God heard her. Which says she's been praying to him all along. And then after this scene, we continue on in Genesis chapter 31, where Jacob has decided now that it is time to leave Haran and get back to the promised land. He has had it with Laban. Laban is out shearing the sheep somewhere else. He's got like a day and a half or so of a head start. And so he takes off. Perfect time to get away. And Rachel says, oh, dad's away. Now's the perfect time to steal his idols. Now stop and think about that for just a second. She stole idols. Now, why would she steal idols? Now, if you're wearing your rose-tinted Pollyanna lenses as you read the Bible, where everyone is just perfect all of the time, then probably she was worried that her father was an idolater and she was stealing them to get them out of the house. <clears throat> I hardly think that's what's going on. And there are two basic suggestions that you're going to hear if you read various commentaries. Some suggest that the possessor of these household gods, these teraphim, as your translation might render it, also had the inheritance rights of the family. Now that's a debated issue, and some people say very strongly that's the case, and some people say very strongly it's not the case. But I at least want you to be aware of this. Because she is then trying to secure a great inheritance for herself, or for her children, or for her family. Yet I would suggest to you the very fact that Leah knows who Yahweh is, and puts trust in Yahweh, and praise to Yahweh means that Jacob has already told them about a great inheritance that they have and they don't need anything beyond that. And so to secure inheritance rights physically, especially if they were not hers to have to begin with, she is stealing them from her siblings in this case. That speaks poorly of her character if that's what's going on. But maybe that's not what's going on. Maybe something different is going on. All right. Well, that leads us to the second option. She's an idolater and she wanted the idols. Again, not a whole lot better as far as it goes. Or maybe they had some value and she was going to pawn them off, you know, list them on the ancient equivalent of eBay or Craigslist or something to get some money out of them, whatever the case may be. Uh, no, no matter what you do with this, it's not good. It's theft. And on top of that, it's theft of idols, which is it, it's an unbelievably bad thing to do. And then finally Laban catches up with them because they've got so much, even with their head start, they can't outrun Laban. And Laban gets there and what does she do? She takes these idols that she has stolen and sits on them and tells her father it's that time of the month where she can't stand up and he probably wouldn't want to touch these anyway because they'd be impure. Now again, the text never tells us if she's telling the truth in that instance or not. So we can't say certainly that she's lying. I would tend to think maybe she was, but at the very least, it's in the spirit of deceit to get away with theft is what's going on here. 
even if she is telling the truth about her momentary physiological condition, it's still in the spirit of deceit to get away with theft. And again, it's just not a good moment in Rachel's life. And what Jacob does when Laban can't find the idols is he just absolutely lambasts the guy. It's a fantastic thing to read if you're frustrated with Laban and the narrative. Just let, you know, 20 whatever years of, of Jacob's frustrations, just watch it explode on the page there after Laban can't find any idols. And that's, you know, you get what's coming to you kind of lecture that Jacob gives. It's, it's a, a, you know, monumental sort of thing there. But when you look at Rachel's character, I mean, the attempted pregnancy, the theft of the idols, the spirit of deceit, the naming of the children, she just doesn't look that great. Which is kind of ironic, because at the beginning of the story, she looks really good. In fact, I would point out to you, the only positive thing the Bible ever says about Rachel is that she looked really good. She was uh, pretty and had a nice body. Or if you prefer the delicacy of the Bible, it was beautiful of form and appearance. That's the only good thing that the Bible ever says about Rachel. Beyond that, you just get these glimpses of her character, and she's not the kind of person you really want to spend a lot of time with. And you know people like that, right? You know how malleable a thing beauty is. There are people that you may have thought plain at one point, that the more you get to know them and see their character, the more and more attractive they become. Or someone who once looked very attractive, and then you see that cigarette hanging out of their mouth, for example, and suddenly all appeal is gone. You know how that works. And you can imagine maybe how Jacob began to look at this beautiful woman after living with her for a while. Well, what about Leah? Well, as we've seen, she knows the God of Jacob. She trusts the God of Jacob. She prays to the God of Jacob. She attributes her first four children to the God of Jacob. And she is, is happy and optimistic, the kind of person you like to be around in general. Now, again, she is not perfect. Our, our, our goal here is not to enshrine her in, in sainthood or anything like that. Again, I, I tend to read her giving of her handmaid to Jacob as a, a poor choice. Again, Rachel could at least claim custom. Uh, Leah only can claim rivalry as to what's going on. And if that's a correct reading, then her naming of Issachar as well seems to be off uh, the, the path. And, and this, this sp uh, spirit of sibling rivalry that's going on in all of this seems to be a problem. If she has any role whatsoever in the deception of Jacob on the wedding night, that would deserve censure as well, of course. And we have no idea what role, if any, she had in that. Uh, beyond just being the pawn. But if, if she has, you know, always wanted Jacob since the moment he showed up over these seven years and she sees this opportunity and jumps at it, then obviously there's something wrong with that as well when that's not what the deal had been. And so my, my purpose is to not enshrine her, but simply to point to the fact that she is someone who knows God and someone who is a, generally speaking, pleasant person to be around. Rachel doesn't seem to have quite the same relationship with God, and she very much seems to be the kind of person who is not that much fun to be around. So what then do we see in all of this? Well, one of the main themes of the book of Genesis is the continuation of the Messianic line, of course. God tells Eve back in Genesis chapter 3 that there will be this seed that comes from her. And through the, through the story of Genesis, you see the, the branches of the tree where it will split and one is kept and the other is, is cut off. And the messianic line passes then uh, from Eve to Seth and on down ultimately to Noah to Shem and then on down to Abraham to Isaac rather than Ishmael and uh, to Jacob rather than Esau. And, and how are these choices made? Well, some of it obviously is the predetermination of God, that God is doing what God is going to do. But it's striking to me that in the context of the stories of Genesis, very often there seems to be this focus on people of faith receiving the blessing and people without faith not receiving the blessing. And you get a hint even of, of how that kind of works itself out in Genesis chapter 49 when Jacob is nearing the end of his life and he calls his sons together to bless them. And what you find is it starts at the top. It starts with the oldest. Reuben is going to be the one who receives the great blessing because he's the oldest. Except 
Reuben, you went up to your father's bed, if you remember Reuben slept with one of his father's concubines. And so he does not receive anything special. He is eliminated. Simeon and Levi, they're next. They're of one mind, they're brothers, it says. Weapons of violence are their souls. Let my soul not come into their counsel. These are the brothers who led the slaughter of the Shechemites in Genesis chapter 44 after the Dinah incident. And so they are rejected as well. And then finally the blessing comes to Judah. You say, wait a second, Judah had his problems too. Isn't he the one that, you know, the whole Tamar thing? Well, yes, that was him. He made his mistake. Like, again, a lot of the people in the Bible make mistakes. And if you read carefully, you find that Genesis 37 through 50 is not just the Joseph narrative, as it is often called, but it is the story of Joseph and Judah. Where you've got, on the one hand, the story of Joseph and what's going on in Egypt, and on the other hand, you've got Judah and his development his moral development and his uh, leadership development as he becomes the leader of this family. And he turns from his evil way in Canaan and comes back to the family and leads them and ultimately gives his life or offers his life as a substitutionary sacrifice for his brother. And he is the one then, we are told, the scepter will not depart from him. And the messianic line comes to him. And what I would suggest is at least plausibly then, you have something of a method. God starts with the oldest, and when they're not faithful, they're rejected. And the next one down that is faithful, that is the one the line passes through. Now, this is not to make all of this about human works rather than God's faithfulness or anything along those lines. Don't get too deep in this. I'm just suggesting this is a possibility of how some of this works out. So what does it say then when God gives Leah six children before he gives Rachel two. The deck is being stacked. And why might that be? Well, in the context of Genesis, it might just be because she's faithful and her sister isn't. She knows Yahweh God and prays to Yahweh God and her sister steals idols. Maybe that's what's going on here. And ultimately, if you've never noticed before, the priesthood and the high priesthood come through Leah. The monarchy and the Davidic dynasty come through Leah. And your very savior came through Leah. And that might just be because God chose it that way. Because she was the one who was faithful and her sister wasn't. But I said this was a love story and so we need to get back to Jacob. Obviously, Jacob loved Rachel first, and he loved Rachel best at first. And I think there's a sense in which you could say he never lost that special care for her, or at least for her children, based on the way that he treated Joseph while Joseph was there, and Benjamin after Joseph was gone. But I would point you back to Genesis chapter 35, where something pretty remarkable happens. Genesis chapter 35 is the first scene where Rachel shows up after... The curse has been pronounced on whoever has stolen these idols from Laban. You remember Jacob just utterly lambasts the man as we were talking about a moment ago? Well, well, before that, he says, whoever has stolen these idols will die. Rachel's first scene. But before that even, God said to Jacob in verse 1, Arise, go up to Bethel and dwell there. Make an altar there to God who appeared to you when you fled from your brother Esau. So Jacob said to his household to dwell were with him, Put away the foreign gods that are among you and purify yourselves and change your garments. Then let us arise and go up to Bethel so that I may there make an altar to God who answers me in the day of my distress and has been with me wherever I have gone. So they gave to Jacob all the foreign gods that they had and the rings that they had that were in their ears and Jacob hid them under the terebinth tree that was near Shechem. Jacob just learned something very important here that the text never specifies. And what he learned is that Rachel stole those idols after all. All the gods were brought out. And that would include these that she stole and she hid and she lied about. And after this point, we never hear of his great love for her again. And her next scene, the one where she shows up right after this, is where she dies. And more significant probably than the fact that she dies the first scene she shows up after a curse of death is pronounced is the fact that when she dies, he buries her on the spot. It would have been about 15, 20 miles probably to the cave of Machpelah, the family tomb. 
day's journey, a little bit more maybe, depending on how big the entourage was going back. It's inconvenient, but it's not something that would stop him if he wanted to do that. I know that because later in the book, he tells his descendants to take his body some 300 miles back to that cave. And so if he wanted her buried in that cave, he could have buried her in that cave. He chooses not to bury her there, maybe because of the gross embarrassment that he feels over seeing that she had stolen those idols after all. Maybe because of the fact that he's come to realize over the course of their time together that she is, if I may be frank, a pretty awful person to be around. And he's kind of come to that conclusion already. But whatever the case may be, as the story of the book of Genesis concludes, and he is nearing his death, and he tells his children to take his body back from Egypt to this cave, he says, there they buried Abraham and Sarah, his wife. There they buried Isaac and Rebekah, his wife. And there I buried Leah. She is the one who was chosen by Jacob ultimately. She is the one who he wants to lie next to after this life is over. The great love story of Jacob and Rachel and Leah is not that guys will do absolute, absurdly ridiculous things for hot girls. I mean, that's pretty obvious, right? The great love story is the story that has culminated in real love, not superficial physical attraction. It's a love that is learned. It's a love that is based squarely on a mutual faith in the promises of God and a relationship with this God that they shared with each other. That's the great love story of the Bible. That's what you see in Jacob and Leah, not Jacob and Rachel. And may we all strive to have relationships like that. Thank you for your kind attention today.